Welcome to the next lecture of MCB 182 on the interpretation of functional genomics experiments, or at least the an introduction to interpretation of functional genomics experiments. So last lecture, uh, we learned a little bit about using techniques like CRISPR or siRNA or um, uh, Gatmer oligomers to basically perturb cells and and try to connect uh, individual genes or regulatory elements uh, to different phenotypes, whether those phenotypes are at the uh, organismal level where you're trying to measure, for example, the influence that a gene might have on, say, uh, organism viability, or whether um, those phenotypes are molecular. And so we'll talk a bit more about that in uh, future lectures where you might do a CRISPR screen to knock a gene down, like a transcription factor, and then try to uh, sequence RNA before and after to figure out what genes expression levels might be influenced by that transcription factor. And so the main goal of the lecture today is, is really on trying to learn what you can do with the results of those kind of screens. So say, for example, that uh, you're interested in identifying genes that influence uh, cell viability. So you say somehow you're able to knock down every gene in the genome and measure the viability of a cell. Uh, before and after uh, knocking down that gene um, and you identify say like a hundred genes whose um, you know which after being knocked down <clears throat> greatly change uh, particular cells viability and so the main question you oftentimes want to ask is well what do these hundred genes do like what do they have in common are these just like a hundred random genes or do they uh, you know do they collectively represent some small set of uh, pathways related to say like DNA replication or something um, and so that that's what we mean in this lecture by interpretability we oftentimes have like a gene list um, as a result of some kind of screen and then you want to ask the question well what pathways are these genes involved in or things like this um, and so a related problem is asking the question well you know how can we really communicate and and um, store the results of studies of gene functions right and so you know, with the advent of genomics technologies and all of these kind of genome-wide uh, screens that we can do, um, lots of people are generating tons of information about, oh, you know, what kinds of like phenotypes at the molecular, cellular, organismal level do I see when I knock down certain genes or sets of genes? And so it, it's becoming increasingly important to kind of have some kind of central resource for storing and sharing that kind of information so that um, when you do your screens for a particular phenotype, you can then cross-check them easily against the, you know, the literature or um, other studies in a in an easy way um, to basically see what the see whether there's any connections there. And so, we'll talk a little bit about gene ontology, which is basically one of the biggest resources for um, storing and sharing information about molecular uh, and cellular function uh, across studies. Um, possibly one of the most important parts of this lecture is basically what's called the Go Enrichment Analysis, which is the kind of formal set of statistical tests that you would actually use to ask, you know, to formally ask the question of my, you know, 100 genes that I pulled down from my screen, what do they do? And so we'll talk about how Go Enrichment Analysis is done. And in doing so, we'll basically introduce the concepts of uh, a p-value and permutations and um, what uh, the Fisher's exact test is, which is a very common kind of <clears throat> test that's used both for enrichment analysis as well as many other things. And so here is, so the concept of gene set enrichment analysis and <clears throat> um, pathway enrichment analysis um, and terms like this are, are some of the most prevalent concepts and analyses that you will ever see in any genomics paper. Um, it is very hard to read a genomics paper that, for example, that does not do some kind of gene set enrichment analysis. And so just to illustrate, uh, you know, just to give you an example of, of how people use these gene set enrichment analyses and to give you an idea of what exactly they tell you, here's a, you know, figure one from a relatively recent paper uh, whose goal was to really uh, do a genome-wide screen to identify genes that modulate drug responsive cancer cells. And so the idea here, which is kind of shown in uh, part A of this figure, which is figure one from this paper, um, the authors of this study basically used a patient-derived xenograft uh, 
uh, model of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which is a type of pancreatic cancer. Um, so basically what they did is they uh, took some cancer cells from a pa human patient sample and they grafted it onto a mouse, an immunocompromised mouse, um, and grew the hum human patient's tumor in vivo inside the pancreas of the immunocompromised mouse. And so the way this experiment worked is it, what they did is they first took a whole bunch of cells, so somewhere on the order of like 150, 200 million single cells from the patient sample, and they basically uh, generated a set of about uh, you know, they, they generated thousands of different guide RNAs for CRISPR, which collectively targeted about 4,000 different genes in the human genome. And so what they were targeting is basically genes related to like epigenetic regulation, transcription factors, nuclear proteins, and things like this. And so again, their goal here is to ask the question, okay, of these like about 4,000 genes that we're targeting for with our guide RNAs for CRISPR, uh, which of these 4,000 genes uh, are more likely to modulate or like uh, which which one of these genes when you knock them uh, when you knock them out are more likely to lead to better response of the cancer cells to the drug or lead to worse response um, of the cancer cells to the drug and so basically a week of after injection of these uh, cells into uh, these immunocompromised mice um, the mice were basically randomized into this either like control group or case group, which were given uh, drug treatment uh, for a few weeks. And then basically afterwards, um, they basically sacrificed the, the samples and measured the relative abundance of each guide RNA in either the control group or the case group. And so the general principle here is that um, obviously, as we mentioned uh, in the previous lecture, um, doing these kind of screens with CRISPR guide RNAs and with the CRISPR-Cas9 system uh, sometimes can introduce bias uh, due to differences in efficiency and so on and so on. And so uh, the purpose of having a control group is to basically uh, be able to, is so that you can look at the group where you gave them drug treatment and you can say, okay, well, for each guide RNA, how much of this guide RNA do I see in the cells of, these, of this treatment group? And so the idea is that if you knock if you're knocking down or if, sorry if you're knocking out a gene that is central that or that um you know is really critical for uh resistance of the cancer cell lines or cancer cells to drugs then if you knock that gene out uh then the cells should be much more responsive to the treatment and so uh, basically if you're knocking out genes that uh basically you know, help the cancer cells to resist the drug, then you should see a depletion of that guide RNA in the treatment group relative to the control group. And so the reverse logic also holds where if you see a guide RNA uh, present a lot more in the treatment group than control group, then that kind of suggests that um, cells with that knockout are much more likely to be resistant to the drug than cells uh, without the knockout. And so basically the idea is that you do this screen, you measure the relative abundance of the guide RNAs in the treatment and control group, and then you're looking for guide RNAs <coughs> that are um, significantly uh, less viable uh, after... You're looking for guide RNAs that are significantly overrepresented in the uh, control group relative to to the treatment group because those will be the one so those depleted guide rnas will be the ones that um, you would want to target with therapeutics and so in this figure again basically uh, in part b um, what these authors are showing you is basically the you see a whole bunch of so the rows in this heat map are uh, different guide rnas the columns represent uh, basically your treatment different treatments and so uh, basically uh, blue represents um, guide RNAs which are significantly enriched in the treatments versus controls, and orange represents guide RNAs that are significantly enriched in controls versus treatment. And so the orange uh, bars represent guide RNAs that you know are targeting genes that um, you know hopefully when you knock them down increase the uh, you know increase the sensitivity of the cancer cells to the treatment. And so this, this heat map basically just shows you that they found a bunch of guide RNAs that are both kind of enriched and depleted in the treatment group.
And so part C of this figure basically, uh, you know, because there can be multiple guide RNAs that target the same gene, figure C just translates figure B into a figure that, you know, with respect to genes, not guide RNAs. And so here again, what they've done in figure C is rank genes in terms of um, whether they're depleted or enriched uh, in the treatment group. And so the genes like C and P, uh, you know, basically uh, represent genes which, you know, are the most, uh, you know, are, are the most promising targets for uh, targeted therapy. And then figure D, what figure D shows you is basically just the associated kind of p-value with that viability score. So genes that have um, kind of very small p-value, which are, you know, genes that are very high uh, in this plot, um, basically represent um, results that are statistically significant. And then part E is really the, um, is really the, the, the punchline, which shows you, okay, well, you know, from figures C and D, I found a bunch of genes which are uh, depleted in my treatment group versus controls. And so, you know, here we, you know, hypothetically found like, you know, 10 or 15 of them. And so then the question becomes, well, you know, do any of these genes that, um, you know, who's, you know, when you knock them down, lead to sensitivity of the cancer cells to treatment, do they share anything in common? Like what, what, what are they actually doing um, at the molecular level. And so basically the results of a go enrichment analysis is basically a bar plot like what you see here, where the different bars represent um, different gene functions, which have been annotated in the literature. And the, uh, the x-axis here represents negative log 10 p-value, which basically means that the bigger the bar, the more uh, significant is the enrichment of these uh, enriched or of these, uh, you know, genes that come out of the CRISPR screen, like how enriched is that set of genes that come out of the screen for functions that are kind of known at the at the molecular level. And so what this plot basically tells you is that a lot of these genes that are, um, you know, significantly depleted in the treatment group uh, share a lot of common function in terms of like, um, cell cycle processes or like transcription or RNA metabolism and so on and so on. So I'm going to abuse the term forward and reverse genetics uh, here just to um, make this slide a little bit more easier to understand hopefully, but basically you can think about the experimental design of the last slide as something similar to like a reverse genetic style screen where um, you pick your say 4,000 genes of interest ahead of time, and you design guide RNAs to knock out each individual gene. And then you perform a series of experiments where you take cells, you knock out individual genes, and then you measure the resultant change in cell viability with drug response. Um, and then you do some gene center enrichment analysis after the fact to figure out, okay, what pathways might be involved in, um, in uh, allowing cancer cells to be drug resistant, essentially. And so uh, here I'll illustrate another type of experimental design in which gene set enrichment analysis also helps. And this is, you know, a very broad kind of experimental design. And here we'll call this like a forward genetic style experiment. We're essentially here, I'll, I'll illustrate this, case, this study design in a case control type design, where suppose that we want to study um, the large, you know, the, the differences in either gene expression or chromatin accessibility or epigenomics of the genome um, in, say, tumors, versus, solid tumors versus um, healthy normal tissue. And so here, again, in the language of forward genetics that we talked about in our previous lecture, uh, cancer is essentially our mutagenizer in this case. And so here in our experimental design, we would take a bunch of solid normal tissues that are from presumably healthy samples. We take a bunch of primary tumors from the same site. We would use various kinds of genomic assays like RNA, chromatin accessibility, epigenomics, um, measure genome-wide features for the cases and controls. And then we, this is basically where gene set enrichment analysis would come in and help us ask the question, well, of all the differences in either RNA or accessibility or so on, that we see between the normals and the tumors, what is different? What is significantly different? And um, 
which molecular functions or pathways are being implicated um, by the genes that we see that differ between normals and, and tumors.